Shall we make a start? Uh, so welcome to tonight's Manchester Salon, uh, which is on the legacy of Freud and asking the question of whether childhood is beginning to dominate adulthood. Now, I've chaired many of these sessions in the past and none of them have sold out. So you're obviously not here to hear me. So I'll, I'll keep my introduction brief uh, and then we'll let the speakers uh, do their bit. But one of the reasons we wanted to look at this is because Freud's theories around repression, the unconscious, childhood <coughs> abuse, seem to have permeated society to a certain extent. Even within the recovered memory debate of the 1980s, if you go into uh, the last 10, 15 years, we've even had instances of people like Pete Townsend of the rock group The Who, when he got found to have downloaded images of child pornography, He's, he blamed it on the fact that he was abused as a child. He couldn't remember being abused, but he was quite sure that he was. So these theories seem to have permeated society. But wh what we want to question maybe is whether, is it Freud's legacy? Is it Freud's words? Is it the way they have been interpreted in the contemporary climate and contemporary poli political situation? So hopefully we'll interrogate some of those um, today. We have two um, highly esteemed speakers for you. I'll introduce them in the order they're going to speak. First is James Hartfield. James is a writer and lecturer based in London. He has written uh, sort of widely around a variety of subjects. His most recent books are An Unpatriotic History of the Second World War and The European Union and the Death of Politics. Perhaps uh, more pertinent to tonight's talk is his 2002 book, The Death of the Subject Explained, which sought to chart why there was such a, a focus on the irrationality of the subject today. We really did not view the individual subject as being capable of very much with it. So that, that's James. And next to speak will be Ian Parker. Ian was Professor of Psychology at the University of Manchester. At the moment, it was previously at Manchester Metropolitan University. He's written too many books for me to mention. Um, he's the editor of the Annual Review of Critical Psychology. He's a member of Asylum magazine. And he's also a practicing psychoanalyst. And his latest book of a long line is Lacanian Psychoanalysis, Revolutions in Subjectivity. And he's also had the dubious pleasure of being my PhD supervisor. And he's, he managed to survive that. So they're going to speak for approximately 12 to 14 minutes each. Uh, and then we'll throw it open for uh, a discussion. OK, go over to James. OK, uh, thank you. Thanks, Ken. And um, me and everybody. Uh, uh, who's made this work tonight. Years and years ago, my dad was um, a precocious student at um, the Andrew Marvell uh, Grammar School in Hull, and um, he scandalised the sixth form common room um, uh, by giving a talk, as he was invited to do by his indulgent conservative master, and um, looking for the thing that would be uh, the most shocking. Uh, and outrageous. Uh, he alighted on psychoanalysis, uh, what was then uh, thought of in Hull anyway, it's very new science. Uh, and um, uh, so he proceeded to tell the, his, his classmates about uh, the Oedipus complex, how they all wanted to have sex with their mothers, um, which uh, you could have heard a pin drop. And um, uh, being an autodidact, you know, was, it got the ball by the horns and he was uh, um, doing it for his work. And after he'd finished, the indulgent, somewhat Tory master, but essentially loved the boy, came up to him and said, uh, yeah, that's, that's so good, David. That's, that was really exciting. He said, um, but I must tell you, the man's name is Freud, not Freud. <laughs> uh, and I suppose that's us, isn't it? Is, you know, we, we've read it, and, um, but we're not familiar. Um, uh, the, uh, well, I, I come kind of with the idea that we should... Um, um, I'd like to big up Freud, but that's a bit eccentric, I know that, because um, what you're really saying is, uh, it's a bit like saying, uh, you know, Chuck Berry is really great, because uh, you know Chuck Berry's kind of important, uh, but when you listen to it now, it seems a bit hokey, 
doesn't it? And uh, he's probably a bit of a pervert. And you, you're most likely to find it on your grandfather's shelves, aren't you? So it's, it's not ex essentially uh, attractive. Freud's reputation has soared and fallen uh, over the years. Um, there was always a degree of resistance to Freud's ideas in Britain because we're, uh, this is the country of uh, sceptical analytical philosophy. And the very idea of an unconscious uh, provoked our uh, native uh, thinkers because the, 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 the idea that there was something that you couldn't put your finger on um, uh, that was nonetheless uh, determinant uh, was shocking to them. The idea that there was um, uh, a something you couldn't see uh, was against all the canons of, of um, dull Philistine English analytical philosophy. You know, things uh, had names and, um, and they were real and you could test them, they were verifiable. But the con unconscious was very difficult to get their uh, handle on. And the terminology, it seemed so strange. Um, well, not so strange, I mean, it was attractive. You know, when we, we were told uh, ego and id, um, it, it appealed. Uh, you know, we, we had some categories to play with. And then the super ego was introduced, and it felt a bit like that bit when you read in the Quran about um, um, uh, Muhammad being flown to Mecca on a winged horse. That uh, maybe it's a bit of an abstruse, uh, abstruse plot device. It's a bit too much. This uh, super ego uh, and ego, and and maybe these categories are uh, somewhat fake and phony and put together, not very convincing. Um, of course, you know, people have pointed out since that um, uh, they're uh, they're wonders of translation. You know, and Freud's own terminology is much more straightforward. He was writing in German. And uh, yeah, to him, it was uh, 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 what you say in English. It would be the um, the I and the it, the, uh, the das ich and und das es. Um, uh, but they become uh, transmogrified um, uh, by Ernest Jones or James Strachey, or you know, one of these translators have transferred them into Latin, ego and id, and they became categories that uh, we should be attracted to for that reason. Um, and again, we, we've, we, we feel a degree of, of skepticism because once you've mastered the categories, you begin to think, well, is it really true? It's a, it seems a bit of a, a, a grand um, a construction. He was criticised later. You know, there, there was a falling out uh, uh, as other um, people coming in the world that he was in um, uh, became more sceptical and, um, uh, you know, the, uh, Ronnie Lang and others um, were sceptical about the, um, um, the intellectual framework that they'd received from the past. They, they felt with some truth that there was something about Freud's own judgments that was somewhat tied to his time, that he was um, a bit of a patrician old man and that his views that uh, the proper order of society was that um, uh, um, you know, fathers led families and that families created persons out of um, the raw material, uh, that this was uh, a somewhat conservative view and was insensitive and uh, indifferent to um, uh, the traumas and tragedies uh, within family life. And that, which I think is right, by the way, uh, that Freud's own view of the family is a little conservative. You know, he took as a model what he grew up with in Vienna, uh, and he thought that was kind of right and, um, you know, difficult, but essentially working, a functioning thing. Functioning would really be the way you would say it. So, there, there, you know, over time there came to be a greater degree of scepticism. Probably the most profound, though, of course, was the, the uh, terrible attack made on Freud's reputation by uh, Geoffrey Masson. Uh, and uh, also uh, with the support of Catherine McKinnon. Uh, Masson was an extraordinary and eccentric, but um, a, you know, fantastic guy in many ways, a genius and a um, crazed person in equal measure. He'd already become a, a champion of Sanskrit, um, uh, uh, but then later he decided to retrain, become a, a psychoanalyst, and he got a job in the Freud archives that's to say, with Anna Freud. And, um, and this was the real damage that um, Masson did, was that uh, he said this terrible thing. He said, look, look, he said, um, 
he didn't say it that way. He said, uh, oh, this is shock. Uh, he said, uh, look, here at the very heart of Freud's theory is a lie. At the heart of Freud's theory is a lie. What's the lie, Jeffrey? Uh, the lie is that uh, young women came to Freud and told stories of their sexual abuse. And Freud heard them and even wrote uh, in his very first paper that uh, um, uh, it, that he was surprised at the prevalence of incest in the family, that um, uh, how many people have reported to him actual abuse. Uh, abuse wouldn't be, of course, be the words that they would have used, but uh, it was the, that's how we would describe it now. Uh, and Masson said that Freud knew that and then later hid the truth. And he said, Freud, what Freud did was um, he heard these uh, young women tell these stories and then he decided that it cannot be true. He decided, because he was a conservative in his, his moral outlook, that it cannot be true and therefore something else was going on. Something else was going on. And what Freud decided was that the, what we, the women were reporting was not actual events of seduction, uh, uh, but their own feelings, uh, the formation of their character within the family, which had an erotic component. And this was shocking charge to make against Freud, or shocking that Freud would uh, uh, deny this fact. I think it's our greatest challenge in a way, it's because I would like to defend Freud even on this, because it struck me that um, uh, Masson's charges are particularly interesting because they get right to the core of the question of what, what it was that Freud had to say that was so unique. And uh, what Freud had to say that was so unique was that the unconscious is not the same as a, an actual event. And that was really important because what he was saying was that these women are not lying. That was Masson's misunderstanding. He said they're not lying. So they're describing things as they <coughs> felt them to be. But what they I am, and this is where I think he departs from um, uh, uh, contemporary trends and certainly from Masson's idea, but I am interpreting. I will interpret because uh, what I feel that I can see is not the ubiquity of sexual abuse in the family, but the ubiquity of the incest taboo. What he's saying is that um, um, what uh, the women reported in their prolonged discussions uh, were um, feelings that they represented as events, feelings of being abused, of be well, being seduced was the terminology he used, um, uh, raped, uh, you may say, in some of the descriptions. Uh, but Freud insists that this is not actual instances, this is not evidence of events that took place in what we might call the ordinary uh, world of events, but of, of a <coughs> psychology, of an unconscious. And this is the terrible thing, because in insisting that Freud was a liar, which Masson did, he played on a, a great fear that we have, the fear that, um, that Freud uh, was a, a, a man who hid child abuse. Uh, and it was a powerful thing to say. But in the very process of doing that, he's challenging the very thing that's unique about Freud's insight. It's unique is, is the deductive, not um, inductive, the deductive <coughs> science of saying there is an unconscious. There are movements within us. There are uh, motives within us which are not yet conscious. They're before the conscious uh, that we're yet to give expression to. And it's for that reason that Freud's reputation, I think, probably today is hardest to defend. Because um, first, it has a, a big, powerful um, headline, he disguised abuse. But more importantly, it's hard to defend because the very thing that is most dramatic, it strikes me, and most valuable in the science, uh, and there are many things that I think you might want to say, well, you know, I'm not sure that that's entirely true. But to insist that, that there is a psyche, that there is an unconscious, that there is a, a realm to be discovered and interpreted, and that this is open to 
a scientific interpretation strikes me as, as the most valuable. Okay. Thank you, James. <coughs> Okay, uh, in fact, James, you put a lot of issues on the table there, and I hope that we'll be able to unpick them bit by bit when we have our, our discussion. First thing I should say is that because of these lights, and I'm not in such a bad position as James, we swapped, suites, uh, uh, swapped seats earlier, but uh, I can't see you really. Uh, so it's rather like uh, being in analysis. Um, now, in this question, the question that frames this discussion uh, is childhood beginning to dominate adulthood, which James didn't talk about, um, but, but we'll come back to it l later, I think. This question is uh, childhood beginning to dominate adulthood, and what is the place of psychoanalysis in that. There are only two questions and I want to say a little bit about the first of those questions first. Is childhood beginning to dominate adulthood? And I think when we look at that question we have to understand that these categories childhood and adulthood that we're using as our concepts here are historically constituted, have changed over time and those two categories are split apart, reified, turned into separate things today. Um, and they have a relation, always have a relation, these categories, with power. In the last 100 to 200 years, those categories, childhood and adulthood, have had a relation with capital, capitalism and the state. Um, so we have to understand how childhood and adulthood are constituted in relation to capitalism and, and the state. And on the one hand, you could say, yes, that childhood is becoming um, a force that dominates adulthood. You can see it, for example, in the way that um, advertisers target children <coughs> and mobilize children uh, to recruit their um, parents into being good consumers. Uh, the advertisers know this. They call it pester power. If you can get at the kid um, and you can get them to want something or you can get them to want their parents to have something, then you can get them to be a very powerful force um, in uh, inciting uh, the, the consumption of more and more commodities. So in that sense, yes, childhood dominates adulthood. There's another sense, of course, in which childhood dominates adulthood, we could say, which is in the uh, infantilization of people, the way that people are treated as if they're children, treated as if they aren't able to make choices uh, on their own, and invited to position themselves when they seek help as if they're victims, always dependent on others. And the trick is that when people start to speak with a position of power and authority and claim what is rightfully theirs, then the ideological trick is that they're not taken seriously because the idea is that they, they sh they, they've already got what they want. Uh, they've got the power to, to claim these things. So why should we uh, give, them, give them these things? Only when they position themselves as victims are they taken seriously. But this is only one side of the equation, and it's a side of the equation which is emphasized in some of the work uh, that appears in the, um, the uh, Institute of Ideas and the Spiked Online website. It, it, it mines that side of the equation very well. But there's another side of the equation which is also important, equally important, and you have to approach this question dialectically, look at the two sides of the question, and that is today, adulthood dominates childhood even more than ever. It, you can see it dominating childhood, for example, in the sexualization of children, in the ways in which children are treated as of their little adults and expected to have the same kinds of desires, the same kind of sexuality as adults. That's something that psychoanalysis always put in question, but that is a, an ideological assumption that is powerful today. And it's also there in the way that people are made in these times of neoliberal capitalism to be adult, self-sufficient individuals. 
as the National Health Service is being dismantled, people are told that they should take responsibility for their health and well-being and look after themselves. They should be adults. There's nothing childish about the neoliberal subject. For all of the emotional talk, the emotional literacy talk, the subject is constituted as an adult and set against any kind of uh, dependence uh, uh, on others. So we have to look at the two sides of the equation. And that brings us to psychoanalysis. Because psychoanalysis as a practice, as Marxism was as well, and there were very close connections between psychoanalysis and Marxism in the early years of the development of psychoanalysis in the early 20th century. Psychoanalysis was a child of the Western Enlightenment, and it looked back to that idea and took seriously, very seriously, that idea that people should, in the terms outlined by Immanuel Kant in his essay, uh, An Answer to the Question, What is Enlightenment? that individuals should have the courage to think for themselves. And that's exactly what psychoanalysis is concerned with. You find lots of images of psychoanalysis in the media, as if psychoanalysis is trying to turn people into needy little children, uh, concerned with regression, trying to turn them back into children again. But psychoanalysis actually is a practice which is concerned with the privileging of adult rationality over childhood and inviting people to go into clinical treatment to think about what has happened to them from the standpoint of being an adult, not from the standpoint of being a child. Now, I want to give you three examples from the three main traditions in psychoanalysis just to drive this point home. The main tradition in psychoanalysis in the English-speaking world, which became dominant after the Second World War, especially uh, powerful in the United States, but with some influence in Britain uh, through the work of Anna Freud, Sigmund Freud's daughter, was called ego psychology. And the ego psychologists looked to one of the phrases in Sigmund Freud's later writings, an essay in 1933, in the new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis, where Freud says, the aim of psychoanalysis is, and he puts it this way, it's translated as, where it was, their ego shall be. Where it was, their ego shall be. And he carries on with a metaphor which links this developmental narrative with a narrative about the development of civilization. He says, it is the work of culture not unlike the draining of the Zyder Z. It is very clear that the task of psychoanalysis is not to release the infantile id, but actually to increase the power of the ego, to drive back the forces of the id. Some problems with that conception of psychoanalysis, but that was the dominant form of psychoanalysis in the English-speaking world. And it's in that tradition that you have, for example, the discussion of various defense mechanisms that people use to protect themselves, which categorize defense mechanisms that we use into immature defense mechanisms and mature defense mechanisms that should be supported and reinforced in the, in the process of the analysis. And you see it, for example, in some of the worst aspects of the ego psychology tradition in France, in the work of Janine chasque smirgel who uses this notion of ego psychology to attack anyone who would want to confuse adults and ch children, to confuse the generations, um, which she labels as being perversion. So it's a, it's, a, it's a use of psychoanalysis which clearly privileges adulthood. The second tradition I want to talk about is the tradition which became dominant in Britain uh, around the work of Melanie Klein. Melanie Klein uh, still informs most British tradition psychoanalysts uh, here. And for Melanie Klein, although Melanie Klein worked with children, and you might then assume that she wants to reduce us all to being children, Melanie Klein is very clear 
that the processes that she describes as happening inside the infant, problematic descriptions, but we come to that <coughs> in discussion perhaps, the processes that she describes, the paranoid schizoid position and the depressive position, are not developmental stages, but they are positions. They're positions that we move backwards and forwards between through our adult lives. And the task of psychoanalysis is to reinforce the more mature of those positions, the depressive position. So again, it's from the standpoint of an adult that the analysis is carried out. And when we look at regression in psychoanalysis, the idea that um, people should in some way get in contact with childhood feelings in the process of analysis, we have to notice, first of all, that this is contained in the psychoanalytic clinic. We're not encouraging people to run around outside and behave as if they're children. And crucially, it's a great regression that is accompanied by reflection. That is, the tr that is the key thing of psychoanalysis, that as the infantile experiences and feelings emerge, we are reflecting on what is happening and noticing what we are saying about them. Very adult thing to do. Finally, in the third tradition of psychoanalysis, that which is dominant or most widespread in the world as a whole, which is my tradition of psychoanalysis, which follows the work of the French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, not very powerful in the English-speaking world, but actually, if you look on a world scale, most over half of the psychoanalysts in the world draw, to one extent or another, on the work of Jacques Lacan. It's very clear that Lacan is privileging adulthood in the way that he describes the progress of analysis. And, crucially, he retrieves from Freud a notion of time which is based on a retroactive effect. Freud calls it Nachträgerkeit in his early writings, a deferred action or a retroactive effect in which the experiences that we have as children are given meaning by things that happen to us later on. And that retroactive effect, that peculiar notion of time, which distinguishes psychoanalysis from any notion of psychology, as, as it is taught in the universities here, that notion of time in psychoanalysis functions all through the analysis so that we're always understanding what happened from the standpoint of the present day. And when Lacanians work with the notion of regression, it's not regression to childhood feelings and emotions. It's not a regression to what Lacan rather scathingly called the affective smoochy woochy, but it is a regression of the signifiers, that it is a regression to the terms that were used, the terms and phrases that become important to us in forming our identity, and which we're then able to hear ourselves speak as we engage in analysis. So psychoanalysis is not part of this trend of reducing things to childhood or allowing childhood to dominate adulthood. It is, if anything, the reverse. It's the opposite. And at the same time, psychoanalysis understands this relationship between childhood and adulthood dialectically, so it understands that even when we are adults, we, to some extent as human beings, are dependent on others, and that dependence on others gives us the opportunity to engage in collective action to empower ourselves as well as individual reflection. Okay, thank you, Ian. Lots, lots to think about there, and uh, so we'll throw it open to the audience in a minute. I suppose if I could just ask a question to sort of get, get the flavour of it then. If, if we look at sort of the, the, the focus on childhood, sort of, is there any reason why we could uh, say there is the focus today? Because, I mean, if you think even, even left sort of use children, 
don't they? It is a sort of to take away from adult responsibility. If you think about asylum seekers, you get things like end child detention. You know, what, what about adult detention? Isn't that a problem? End child poverty. Well, isn't poverty a problem? So there seems to be, in the whole political spectrum, there's this focus on children as a sort of negation of adults engaging with the world. I'm just sort of wondering if sort of where you see that coming into it. Why have we got to such a situation uh, like that? Mm. I, I, I remember being in Manchester, um, living here in, um, in Wally Range in 1993, and um, uh, around the time that um, Jamie Bulger was killed, and some of the people in this room <coughs> organised a meeting to talk about it, and um, uh, some of the changes that um, took place in the law at the time were really intriguing because um, it was one of those events where people uh, feel that something must be done, I, that was compelling, um, and that um, they felt very sure about what they were doing. Uh, and they, they made something that if they'd have ever looked to recognize it, as some of them did later on, they'd have been amazed. Because they what they did was um, um, like Jack Straw uh, polemicized for, and then as uh, it later became the Home Secretary that made the change, is they, they effectively they reduced the age of, of um, uh, responsibility. You know, they, they changed, uh, you know, the, we had this law, it was a bit peculiar. He made fun of the fact that it had a, a Latin name, it's called Doli in Capax, um, incapable of harm. Um, I think, not the Latin is coming. Uh, and um, the, the point of the, the change in the law was to, um, to recognize that small people could do damage to yet smaller people or others. Uh, and uh, to, to wake up and say, recognize in these uh, that you call children, um, responsible um, agents who must be punished for their bad acts uh, and in the clamor of the moment um, these changes were made and, and I can remember being unhappy and um, arguing about it and not really quite understanding it but um, as it came clear it, it seemed to, I mean there were consequences that nobody really expected so um, uh, it's part of why there is a, a large uh, juvenile prison population today um, is because of that change in the law. Because we'd made this odd confusion, um, presented this terrible event, that um, we looked at children and we saw them as if they were um, um, grown people uh, capable of shouldering the burden of a judgment. And one of the psychologists that worked with the two children uh, said, with tears in her eyes, she said that, uh, and they were drawing um, pictures with crayons in the courtroom while they were being tried because they didn't really know what was going on. No grown person, well I suppose some grown person might be doing that uh, in contempt or whatever, but it was a sign and, and you think then you think well how could you make that terrible mistake? How could you look at a child and see a man? How could you uh, look at a, a, um, a, a juvenile and see a grown person who could understand what they were doing? And I think that it was, it was at the other end the change was happening. It was because um, the political process, the social process, I don't know quite how to characterize it, but had been gradually eroding that sense in which we were expected to be, us adults, to be authors of our destiny. Uh, we'd been told again and again that um, you know, we weren't really to be trusted with the local council that instead the Urban Development Corporation would spend the money, that we weren't to be trusted with the levers of government, that we were a bit too stupid for that, that experts would have to take our place. And we'd lost gradually over time the sense of ourselves as, as, as authors, as uh, agents. And it was in that context that we could then look at the kids and say, oh yeah, well, you know, maybe they're grown-ups too, you know, because it doesn't seem that different from us. It's the dis distinguishing line, I very much agree with him, that it is a dialectical question. It, uh, the diminution of the adult is also a confusion, a blurring of the line between the adult and the child. You, it's not to have a strong sense of the difference comes about because you don't have a strong sense of, of um, civil uh, liberality. You know, the, uh, when they brought the law in, the Dole and Capaz, it was because they were fed up with hanging kids for stealing sheep. It was a very practical thing. 
Uh, you could be hung in those days for stealing a sheep, but if you hung a child for stealing a, um, uh, a chicken, even a medieval peasant could see there was something freakish going on. That was why they brought in the rule. But you see, that in a very primitive time, the sense of distinctness of adults is quite weak. The sense of, um, uh, and you know, you say, and I agree, that uh, you know, the historical um, invention of childhood was one of the books that was described. You know, that people didn't have special children, uh, clothes for children or time for children. It wasn't school time. Uh, uh, this is a, a modern invention and a glorious one, may I say, a glorious one to, to demarcate, to insist upon the, pot, the room for development. Um, I've got daughters of my own. Um, uh, and I'm, I want to keep uh, the adult world away, as you know, not insanely, but I don't want them to be rushed too quick headlong into that. It's a great achievement, and we're losing it. We're losing it over time, not really because children have changed that much, but because grown-ups have a less, less confident, less uh, strong sense of, of the fact that they're in charge, and they're reluctant to s tell the kids um, don't do that. They're reluctant, certainly, to tell other people's kids, don't do that. that that's big taboo these days, as anybody with kids knows. Um, uh, and, you know, they because they have a diminished sense of their own adulthood. I mean, there, there's some, something particular about the way that uh, children are seen as uh, needy little beings that need protecting in, in, in Britain. I have to remember, for example, that the, um, the RSPCA, Royal Society Protection of, uh, Protection of Cruel, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, was founded in Britain before the NSPCC. Um, and when the NSPCC, uh, National Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Children, was founded, it used the statutes of the RSPCA as its basis. <laughs> They, they shared the same building for a while uh, in the 19th century. Um, and then when the NSPCC started to make a claim for charity, uh, there was a conflict opened up between the RSPCA and the NSPCC. And so you have a separate domain here, which is constituted of these, these poor children who, who need to be, to be uh, protected. And indeed, to some extent, they do. Um, and I, if anything, I think the lesson of the, uh, the Jamie Bolger case is um, not so much that people are uh, infantilized, that the children are, have their rights taken away from them, but they're treated as little adults, isn't that the case? Uh, that, that, that it's the adulthood that starts to dominate and push out the domain of childhood, and it operates in a very contradictory way in relation to this, this question of the way in which people who are dependent uh, or helpless are treated as if they're children. It's like they're pushed to the margins at the same time as they're infantilized and treated as not having any rights to speak within the general discussion and general political activities uh, that, that, that we're engaged in. So um, it's, it's, it's a very uh, complicated process here and uh, I think if anything from what you said and the issues that have been raised it, it points to a problem of adulthood rather than the problem of childhood coming to the fore here. And we need to think about that as a frame for these questions of where psychoanalysis goes. Okay, I'll bring it out to the audience. Does anyone want to tell us about their childhood <laughs> or their adulthood or any, any questions, any comments? Uh, I'll take about three, four, maybe five at a time and then I'll bring the speakers back. So, you know. I was talking about my account of particularly. <laughs> I'm not a psychologist, I've never studied psychology. <clears throat> but uh, I've read one or two books on personal development. And um, from what little I've read of Freud, I've often found it a little bit depressing, and it seems like shackles about other experiences. But whenever I've read um, books out that are saying raised on personal development, Freud hardly gets a look in. But um, as far as I'm aware, two of his contemporaries, Adler and Jung, Get a lot of um, serious mention on the basis that, uh, as far as I can see, Adler and Jung seem to suggest that if you're prepared to sort of uh, step forward in confidence and listen to good counsel, you can move forward. Whereas Freud 
then you're probably correct there, but seem to suggest um, tough mate, you can try and be basically shackled by how you were, um, brought, brought up or whatever. And I mean, rather than putting children as adults, again, I get the impression that, I mean, for example, when I was a kid, <laughs> um, you know, if you were sort of a, I don't know, very egotistic, guarding attention, you're seen as self-centered. Whereas now that's excused because you've got attention deficit disorder. And it seems there's so many excuses now that whereas um, in past times, I'm not suggesting you should be angry kids for Stephen Sheep, <laughs> but, um, but in so much as most people, although they might differ on their definition, well, um, if I said to most people, you know, the difference between right and wrong, most people would probably say yes. And it seems that there's so many um, now excusing syndromes that it makes wonder how long will it be before the likes of the ultra ripple will be excused because of. Yeah, this syndrome or this syndrome. He was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia actually not long after he was um, sentenced. There uh, was someone next to you. Hi, um, I'm a mother of three children, three boys. Um, I'd just like to make the comment regarding the childhood is seen as being an innocent time. But to me, this idea of children having this innocence also makes them desirable, perhaps along the lines of, you know, people want something that's innocent. So are we not endangering our children by sort of putting them out there as being this innocence of something that's, you know, not sexual and they don't have these desires and they're not aware of what's occurring, you know, whereas I believe Freud, through translation, has been lost and that was the idea of what he spoke about in the writing that he said that we all, you know, it's all there within us and to class children as innocent, are we making them desirable more and at risk? Thank you. Anyone else? Uh. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, just referring back to my own childhood in, the, in a small mm -hmm. town in the, in the northeast of England, uh, my memory of, of, of childhood is, is pretty much a, an adult free experience, actually. <laughs> um, and, and we had contact with adults, of course, in, in schools and, and, and occasionally at home. But, but the adult one was, was very different to ours, and, and, and as, as, as children, uh, it, it, there was quite a, a self-regulating and complex uh, society, and, and that uh, society was, was, was actually quite uh, self-determining in, it, in its own way. It, it, it was powerfully cultural um, and, and self-determining. and. Uh, so it, it seems to me that, 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 that what happens is um, that, that somehow there's been a sort of adult liberal encroachment into childhood, a kind of a grasping hand that, that, that seems to, to, to sort of want to take a hold of childhood and in a way control it, I, I, I feel. And, and, and it seems to me that it happens at a multiple level of, of uh, of planes, really, in, in lots of ways, and so, so yeah. So that, that, that's kind of what I wanted to say. It, it seems to me the darkness is coming from the adult world, okay. powerfully in, in, into childhood. Okay, thank you. And uh, just in front of you, and then Simon at the back, and then I'll bring the speakers in. I, I'm trying to get a sort of sense of what. I think it's probably behind what both of you are saying, but. We're seeing I, I, people as either children or as adults. And to, to what extent are we, in doing that, occupying some sort of ideological position? And to what extent are sort of adult and child a consequence of a particular ways of structuring self? But I'm trying to think in terms of how I conceptualize myself from my own inner experience. Like I can remember that as a child, I try to imagine myself as an adult. I just wasn't quite sure I sort of teach us sort of saying things like what you ought to be when you grow up. And I sort of remember the whole primary is also be a press repress a sort of press reporter, unfortunately go down that direction. But for me as an adult, I find it much harder to sort of think in terms of conceptualising myself as a child. 
So like what various stories I tell about when I went to Butlins in 1964 as an eight year old. But the thing is, I've told that story so many times now, it's basically an adult version of that eight year old child. And I can go back to various parts of me, and there's a sort of, there's, there's sort of sense of past versions of me that have been adultified. And, but to sort of, I just try to get a sense of how one can actually do the work, and I'm sure this is sort of central to a lot of psychoanalytical work. How can you do the work of getting back to seeing yourself as a child from a child's perspective? Like, is that something which is possible? Or is it always a case of the child being reclassified through particular adult perspectives? Question? Simon, I don't yeah. this person. Ian, I take your point about the uh, importance of um, proper clinical uh, psychoanalysis. But what we have in the modern world is a million miles from that, it seems to me, certainly in uh, popular society. Um, and to recount a, a, a discussion that I had this afternoon in therapy, uh, I was on Facebook with uh, Denny Joe, and we were talking about uh, our childhood experiences and uh, what it was like being at school. And I do remember uh, even at primary school where uh, my school teacher would give me money to go out uh, to the uh, shops over a main arterial A road. Uh, and buy his lunch for him. And then similarly, uh, buy stuff from the hardware shop for, for other teachers. For anything like that to happen nowadays is completely unimaginable. The idea that kids should be allowed that uh, degree of freedom or responsibility um, is completely and utterly unimaginable. Something's happened, something very profound has happened where adults in the adult world look at each other and look at them as potential abusers. And that same scenario nowadays, I'm sure, would be uh, a story about being groomed, uh, ready for uh, some awful uh, situation. Now you cite neoliberal, uh, conservative, uh, politics for being responsible for transforming the way that adults are, are seen or the way that adults see children. But I don't really get that because that surely happened a lot earlier um, politically and socially and uh, James uh, highlights the, the Jamie Bulger uh, case. So a lot of these developments have happened a lot earlier so what is it? It's not a, uh, an elite that have sat up there and uh, decided to politically change the balance. Something far more profound uh, and, and socially widespread has happened. Uh, and it's happened at a much earlier uh, kind of time frame. So could you just elaborate a little bit more in the way that uh, therapy has become popularized and thoroughly degraded outside of proper clinical uh, therapy. Okay. So I'll bring them in, so just to summarise, so hopefully I'll summarise these actually. Why Adler and Jung and not Freud? Uh, isn't this promotion of childhood as a space of innocence problematic in making them desirable? Uh, has adults, have adults colonised childhood in the sense that childhood used to be an adult free space? Uh, do we come from a specific ideological position when we look at this? Is meaning as much about the present as it is the past? I suppose I'd like to add to that then. Couldn't that also mean, I think there is a, an element of truth in that. Um, memory isn't like replaying a, a videotape, showing my age there, replaying a DVD. <laughs> um, but can't you see that that could easily be used by those who would wish to deny the reality of child sexual abuse, for example? Um, and the, the final question, in the psychoanalytic tradition, I suppose we've got very good therapists like yourself, um, but what's happening in society is a million miles away from that um, laudable tradition. Mm. Over to the two of you, whoever wants to. Okay. Oh, well, 
Yeah, go on. I, I mean, they're difficult questions, um, and there aren't there aren't sim simple answers to them. And I do agree that there is a big difference between the practice of psychoanalysis, the issue that Simon raised, and the way in which um, psychoanalysis is framed in the media, uh, the way in which psychoanalysis is reduced to being some kind of therapy. Um, but um, I think we have to take seriously that practice because it's that practice that people meet when they come into psychoanalysis, when they actually find it for themselves. Um, and for some people it is a shock, it is a surprise uh, to come into psychoanalysis and to discover that they're not going to be treated like a child and that the, uh, the aim of psychoanalysis is not to reduce them to a childish uh, state. Um, but in doing, in doing that work, in going into psychoanalysis, the first step that is taken is a very courageous step. It's a step in which you open yourself up to speak about things to someone that you don't know, to speak in such a way that you have never spoken before, to speak about things that you have never spoken about before in many cases and to put uh, pieces of the puzzle together so that you can make uh, sense of them. And uh, uh, that's what I wanted to emphasize. And in terms of the popularization of psychoanalysis, it's not only uh, an infantilization of people that comes through in the popularization of psychoanalysis. The different versions of psychoanalysis that I describe Ego psychology, Melanie Klein, Jacques Lacan, are all forms of psychoanalysis that circulate in our culture and give models for us to be human beings and to think about ourselves. Um, with respect to Adler and Jung, um, I leave Adler uh, aside for a moment. There are very, very few Adlerians left in the world now. They're more a fantasy of psychology textbooks than anything else. There was a small group in London a few years ago, but they didn't get registration with the UKCP because they weren't doing analysis. They were simply giving people advice on how they should live their lives. It wasn't a therapy recognized uh, by the registration bodies. And uh, yeah. Jung, I just leave aside as not being psychoanalysis. Uh, maybe we can come to that, uh, that later. Uh, I've got a friend who used to <coughs> teach in Manchester. When people used to ask him about Jung, he used to say that Jung made him feel sick. And of course, the students immediately rushed to the library uh, to read Jung as a result of that. So I won't make uh, that mistake. Um, I agree with the, the point about um, children being presented as innocent, and as being presented as something a category of being that is desirable to us at a time in which the world seems to have been completely degraded and sexualized, and in which we search for something of human experience that isn't touched but by, by that degradation and sexualization. And the category of the innocent child does function very neatly. Uh, in that kind of way, uh, ideologically, is that place into which we can put our hopes and fantasies of, of, of something that escapes the, the terrible things of the world. But it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that Freud um, uh, 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 insisted on in the development of psychoanalysis, that um, we all, all of us, have destructive and sexual feelings that we defend ourselves against. And we have always, all of us, had those destructive and sexual feelings that we learn to defend ourselves against. And the big puzzle with the story about Geoffrey Masson in the Freud archives is that Masson claims that Freud tried to pander to psychiatry in Vienna um, by covering up actual childhood sexual abuse and inventing psychoanalysis in order, to, in order to become acceptable. The big puzzle is why he did it by inventing a theory 
in which he told his audiences that we all have sexual and destructive feelings, which was surely much more scandalous and enraged people even more. That is, uh, if he intended to curry the favour of the audience, he certainly wasn't, uh, wasn't going in the right direction. Psychoanalysis is a scandal in Western culture, and it, it makes us think in a different way about the nature of the, nature of, uh, the, 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 the human being. Okay, um, there are other things that came up, and I haven't dealt with them. We'll, we'll re return to them later on. I should pass over to Jake. Yeah, that was excellent. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, on the uh, sorry, the, the guy at the back started on the the Jungian Adler and um, where is Freud and and I think um, you know with with a lot of our answer here already is that um, Freud's influence of uh, psychoanalysis his influence is ubiquitous. It's it's uh, and so much so, like so many things that you you you, you forget and you don't notice it and it, it becomes written into the culture and I suspect. Um, in, a, in a kind of cack handed nonsensical way. Um, uh, often. I, I don't mean that, uh, it, you know, that, that it, it's not interpreted in a good way, but often, I think, in a very cack handed way. Uh, because there's something in the present makes us like the story uh, that uh, I have lost my job uh, because of the terrible things that happened to me when I was young. Or I have, you know, or I've been mean to my wife again. Uh, uh, I must have a destructive impulse that I can't restrain. And um, and this is a kind of cod, Freud, I think that uh, people often um, uh, deal in, and uh, novelists in in particular. Um, and I was just talking um, uh, uh, to a friend who's a keen uh, student of literature, and we were both both saying how depressing and boring it is at that point when you read the modern novel when you realise that the motivating characteristic of the character is that they were abused in childhood. And um, the very thing that the author imagines is the thing that will make it um, stand up and become attention-seeking is actually kind of trite um, uh, um, nonsense that really takes all the... I was just reading Ross Raisin's um, uh, God's Own Country. And at the point when it slips into the abuse story, you think, oh, well, all the subtlety went out of your... Uh, novel, I've, and I've really upset um, <laughs> Ken because I, I, I I'm not going to name the novel, um, uh, but I did, uh, uh, and it, of course it's all about him being abused by his uncle, um, which Ken's face dropped and said, "You don't mean?" And I said, "Yes, I'm sorry, I do." Um, I, I don't know if he's I'm halfway talk. through it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I, I think this happens all the time because it, it, it's a, it's a, it, 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 I'm amazed that no literature student has done it yet. It's, it, wouldn't this be a great piece of work just to say what a weird um, modern late 20th century, early 21st century cliche this is that um, uh, uh, the whole key to all motivations is uh, and I was abused as a child. Um, it, I don't think that is Freud's story. Um, I think it's a, it's a misreading of Freud's story. I think it comes from roughly the same place. We're interested, we like the story of repression, I think because it's kind of true. Um, uh, that there are the ways, uh, as, as Ian described, the way we deal with um, the earlier uh, urges uh, and we, you know, we um, sublimate them in different ways. Um, these are what ways our characters are formed. Um, so we're attentive to it. But we like the story in its vulgar form because it's um, it's a, it's a, a, a shying away from um, uh, uh, self-authorship. It's 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 a, a sense in which we feel a release from uh, authority over our own lives. Um, I was very interested in what Ian had to say about um, I forget what it was called about um, uh, between Lacan and Freud of the that thing when you look back. Mm. Um, what's, what's the term on it? Natriglikite. Because my, I was going to use, I was going to change the names. I'm still going to change the names. So the, uh, as an as a anecdote, I know these uh, uh, three sisters um, who are all obviously raised by the same family. And, uh, and, and one sister is convinced that her father is emotionally and, and physically abusive and a terrible man. And uh, um, and is it still confronts him on a regular basis, 
demanding apologies, writes letters to him. Um, uh, and he's um, an interesting character with you know, lots of complexity himself. I don't can give it a fair account. Um, but the other two sisters don't share this view. And they remember a very different childhood. And each event, they actually remember. But it's not their view. And in the case that both sisters are relatively successful, the sister I'm talking about is relatively unsuccessful. And it strikes me as it, it, I, that it's compelling that her interpretation of her prehistory uh, is on the morbid side. Because her life is, is difficult and she's, she's not managed in different ways to cross the, bar the barriers that she could have done. Uh, and to her, it looms larger, the restraints <coughs> loom larger. Whereas those other sisters who um, uh, have made more successful lives, um, uh, they, they see all the same events, but they just have less bite. Mm. And I would say that's kind of, that would, was going to be my anecdote to describe it's, I know it's nonsensical, but um, you know, our attitude to our past is a kind of, um, you know, we feel it overwhelm us when we are less confident, and we feel it containable when we are more confident. That's to say, uh, in an ironic way, uh, it's the present creates the past, not the past creates the present. Okay. Throw back out to the audience. It was, quite, it was quite an interesting question uh, that we had here. Because, um, you said that adulthood, you, you haven't seen adulthood, uh, adulthood dominates more than more than ever before. Um, I'm not, I'm not uh, a psychoanalysis, I haven't had any experience in it. I've read a little bit. But my area of, in, uh, one of the areas I was involved in was uh, substance abuse. And it's a really interesting sort of area because I'm sure this is really frustrating that you have cod psychology going on all the time. What you have is sometimes you have professional intervention or you get a, what I call dilettantes. And the whole aspect of it, or the whole idea behind it, is that your addiction, your alcoholism, is a result of your childhood. And to me, that is the thing that seems very popular. Any problem that comes up now is regress back to your childhood. And I think that's, um, I think that what's happening in society, you, you cannot say that uh, it's, it's adult dominating. I think there's, it, it's a mixture of both. And I think that is a, an aspect of the fact that society in itself doesn't actually know where it's going. That there was this massive confusion. It has been going on for a long time. Uh, we've seen it in uh, Christopher Ash, uh, noted this in the 70s, sort of thing. And you have all kinds of lunatic psychoanalysis psycho stuff like Milan Wright's uh, Primal Scream, all this sort of stuff. But I think the whole idea of is that psycho psychoanalysis and all the various forms <coughs> is being used is is being used not consciously but it's undermining responsibility and I, I do think that there is this thing of like uh, which you do see in the sexualization of children <coughs> which you have seen in the uh, <coughs> in the lowering of the age of responsibility after the well the, well uh, the border sh sh uh, trial but you still see this dominant thing of that. Uh, we need professional help, sort of thing. As adults, we all need to be guided for our lives. And there is this sort of tie that everything that's wrong with you now is a result of what happened to you as a child. Um, I don't, I, I do see that as the whole point, part of uh, what has happened to the world in the past, probably since the end of the Second World War, actually. But um, I, think it's, I don't think you can actually say for definite that either is dominating. I think the confusion, confused times that we live under uh, is used as a very convenient excuse. We're always told that these are very confusing times. And one of the things is the 
uh, idolization of uh, uh, childhood or innocence, if you want, is actually, in one sense, uh, you can look on as the idolization. <coughs> excuse me, the idolization of uh, ignorance, which is basically what uh, children are. Which is, uh, you know, they are ignorant for the simple reason they haven't had the experience of the real world. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Just this. Um, one of the things I want to know is about um, adulthood, dominating childhood, is the concept of the useful child. So, for example, in the West, we're into nurturing and protecting our children. But in earlier times in the West, we sent our children to work in the factories and we weren't necessarily mm -hmm. protecting them to that degree. And how that blends with children across the continent who are still useful children today, and how adults may dominate that situation as well. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. Could you argue that uh, one of the, the a distinction between childhood and adulthood is knowing what you want? Um, so, for example, the child would say to uh, the, the mum, you know, I'm, I'm bored, and the mum would know why the child was bored and would say, well, go out and play. But, the, you know, the adult, with the experience of life, is able to know what they want. And so, to that extent, could you argue that the sort of psychoanalysis and the proliferation of experts who, who try to explain people to themselves infantilises adulthood because it says that you don't know what you want? And the second question is, I'm struggling to understand the significance of your opening <coughs> explanation of Freud and the unconscious, um, because you said that the present dominates the past. So we are arguing in, in the your support of the Freudian um, explanation of the individual character on the basis of the unconscious, that it's a question of people might not know why they want what they want, but they know what they want. Um, and it, it was an argument against the reductionist idea of explaining the character according to past experience. Is that what? What was the significance of of your opening um, remarks? Okay. For a yeah. yeah. Um, I just I just sort of I think summed up your sort of opening bit. And I just put um, so what you're saying is that Freud's own childhood clouded his professional judgment in his analysis because of his childhood. No. No. I don't know what his childhood was like. Maybe he did. Right, okay. So I'll, I'll throw one in for each to come back up as well then. Maybe it's something similar. Because <coughs> I, I think um, so Dennis was touching on, on the fact that I've always worked in the theory that to understand society today, you need to understand how we got to where we are today. So why shouldn't the individual be any different? Why shouldn't to know where the individual is today, <coughs> we need to under, understand the past and their childhood. Just to throw that in. It's great being the chair, I don't have to answer anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, that's one of the things that uh, connects uh, psychoanalysis with Marxism. Mm. That we have to understand where we've come from you know, in order to understand where we are today. There's a historical process at work there. I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, but those two domains of activity psychoanalysis and Marxism have been split apart more than ever. In the early years there were very close connections between psychoanalysts and Marxists and uh, a lot of the psychoanalysts in uh, continental Europe were in some way or another sympathetic to the left, either they were supporters of the socialist parties, in some case even supporters of the communist parties. And that link between psychoanalysis and Marxism was broken with the rise of fascism when the psychoanalysts who didn't end up in the concentration camps had to flee uh, and come to Britain or go to the United States or other countries. And um, when that happened, um, they had to adapt themselves to their, to their host culture that they were fleeing to. The new, the new culture in the United States, for example, adapt themselves and change psychoanalysis from being something that was a process of critique and understanding, historical 
process of critique and understanding into something that was adapting people into being good citizens to be part of the culture. That's, that's the central critique that Lacan makes against the American ego psychologists, that that's what happened to psychoanalysis. Uh, fortunately, through the Lacanian work, we have a retrieval, a potential retrieval of that radical heritage of psychoanalysis and a connection between uh, cultural critique and individual critique. How we connect the two is, is difficult, but, uh, but it's a very, very important um, uh, connection. Um, the question about the useful child is a nice one. Uh, in Capital, Volume 1, uh, Marx um, goes into great detail of the ways in which uh, capitalism in Britain is founded on the labour of children. Their nimble little fingers, he says, are the ones that can do the sewing and the weaving and uh, the, the, the minute work that's needed in the factories. Um, and he has specific sections of capital devoted to the labour of women, to the labour of, the, the of uh, immigrant uh, subjects, mainly from Ireland, and of children. Children are absolutely crucial there. And cr children are turned from being uh, 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 something uh, that is, uh, doesn't really exist properly as a category into something that we can constitute it as readily exploitable. And we have to, have to put that at the origin of where we see uh, childhood uh, 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 today uh, uh, as well. Um, I want to uh, come to this uh, question of uh, childhood sexual abuse because it uh, kind of hovers around in the discussions uh, uh, about psychoanalysis. Um, it looks very much from Geoffrey Masson's work and for all of the problems with Geoffrey Masson's account. It's very useful, it's a very nice book, uh, his book The Assault on Truth, because it does draw attention to the way in which Freud in the early years did see actual childhood sexual abuse as, as, as being the cause of later hysteria. And the, the, um, the development of psychoanalysis as such, as something, as a serious uh, independent uh, discipline, was founded on that moment where Freud realized that you didn't need actual childhood sexual abuse to occur to produce the traumas that we all live with. But there's childhood fantasy that is uh, 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 also very effective in making our childhood into something that is traumatic. And the point is that you don't need a bad childhood to make yourself into a subject of psychoanalysis, into someone who needs psychoanalysis or who could benefit <coughs> from psychoanalysis. You just need a childhood, a childhood as such, where you're dependent on others. Um, and you have to live through those years of childhood. Um, and dependency and helplessness before you, you eventually become an adult. And those years of dependency and helplessness where things are confusing and incomprehensible are, for many people, extremely traumatic. That being said, um, there, I think we do have to take very seriously the fact that childhood sexual abuse is extremely widespread and there is a danger in treating it as a mere narrative that people use in order to give excuses for their behavior. It is an endemic problem and symptom of the power, the particular power of adults organized in the nuclear family structure in Western culture that makes childhood sexual abuse so widespread. And I think we need to take it seriously as an actual event, as well as taking seriously the fantasies that people have about it when they go into psychoanalysis. Yeah, I think um, um, I, I'd agree with a great deal about the, um, it, I, I was, it was interesting, this question of, of innocence, which of course isn't a category of psychoanalysis, it's a, moral philosophy, when we say innocent child um, and a guilty parent, uh, um, uh, we're saying uh, uh, some, uh, it's, a, it's a moral category and it's very different of course from, from Freud's vision of children which is uh, of, of kind of, it's uh, rampant, it's uh, polymorphously perverse at one point he says which has been troubling people ever since, 
um, uh, but of, of appetites. And, and in that way, it's not so massively different from a, a medieval or Aristotelian worldview, though it is, um, of appetites, and appetites who, that over time are moderated, uh, and um, it, uh, never entirely, uh, but moderated and become agents, become where the it was, let the ego be. The, um, uh, and it's an important transition. And, but the, the question of innocence is compelling to us um, uh, because you know, we're, we're not only psychoanalysts. And um, uh, I, I want to say um, with as much um, vigor as I can that the invention of childhood is a marvelous thing. That um, um, the difference, the differentiation of uh, childhood and adulthood, I, I won't say absolute. You know, it, it's it's a relationship, of course. Uh, is is a human achievement. It's a human achievement of tremendous uh, force and power, and not to be sneered at in any way, uh, 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 because it makes the possibility of development. It makes the possibility of of uh, I mean, you know within all the problems and, and limitations and disasters of the that nightmare, which is the um, uh, nuclear family, um, uh, at least there is space, there's possibility, uh, there's a, a contained route um, uh, so that people are not exposed immediately uh, to the dulling um, compulsion of the market. Uh, and the, you know, the, the great problems with the, the ads that um, demarcated children as a special category, not least for what they did to women in excluding them from work as well. But uh, nonetheless, it's a, it is a great and a marvelous thing, and, and I don't think we should go back on it. Um, uh, I want to say the division is worthwhile, uh, and it's, it's productive and creative. Um, uh, and there is this thing, you know, and, and I take seriously what Ian says about um, um, sexualization, because the, this is the Freud story, is that it's not that, um, he doesn't say that, he, he, or he corrects himself, he doesn't say that sexual abuse is ubiquitous says the incest taboo is ubiquitous because it is a foundation of human civilization. The incest taboo, which means that, of course, there is a degree in which the family is already an eroticized thing because the taboo, you know, don't sleep with the kids, uh, a good taboo, uh, I want to hang on to that, uh, already puts the thought in your mind. In a, you know, it means that uh, it's eroticized relationship uh, and it's a condition in which children grow up in, and, and it is uh, a part of the, the mechanism. So when, uh, 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 now this is very difficult to, to resolve this question of how does society and politics over here interact with um, character formation over here. I think it's, I mean it's great, I agree with you, they're fabulous and exciting and thrilling all the different interactions that took place, the optimism that um, Trotsky came to psychoanalysis with, which I don't think he understood very well, but his, his sheer joy at the idea that it might be possible that science will penetrate the realm of um, uh, the family and, and, the, and the, the, the person, uh, uh, those things, um, you know, all of that. But I want to say too that there's a big, big stretch of a difference. You know, I'm, I no doubt the two are interacting all the time. But to look at one, you must look at one. And to look at the other, you must look at the other. I feel confident um, strongly that um, um, political, social um, movements in our time militate against, um, I, I don't know how to say it, adulthood or, or, or personal responsibility. And this is complicated, I know, because you're actually saying something slightly different from me here. Uh, because, and I understand it, I think, that um, the, it's the, the, the ideology of our age says you are responsible, you must uh, you know, collect for your pension in a way that um, you know, would have been previously deducted, constantly telling us how responsible we are, blah, 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 you know, the neoliberal. Uh, I, but I listen to the qualifier, why is it neoliberal? What's wrong with liberal? Um, uh, the neoliberal is a kind of, it's a formula, you know, somebody barking at you through a tin horn, you will be free, you will decide for yourself, do it, do it. Uh, and it's, it's the very opposite of, of people, as individuals or communities, resolving problems for themselves. It's not really self-authorship, it's a kind of bleating 
uh, you will, and, and the travels are, are very narrow, aren't they? When you, you know, what, what must I do? Must I save? Well, I don't know, where is the interest rate at the moment? Uh, what must I do to be free? Um, and um, so the, the neoliberal discourse isn't really one that honours um, um, authority over, but you know, just control people's authorship of their own lives. So I'd say, you know, in my lifetime, it's been much more associated with the socialist side of the world. You know, the uh, communal um, self-organisation. That's much closer to me to the idea of adulthood, of, of taking responsibility for your life. This is diminished. Um, what it does here, I'm not sure. You know, um, it, the adulthood here has been knocked down. I imagine. I see some evidence, it's very hard to put it together, you know, in my life I, I, around, I see a more confused picture, that's all, really. Uh, 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 the, the boundaries of, and the, the boundaries were never absolute, but um, emerging. It's the, the useful um, child, you know, when I listen to friends who are divorcing, the main use of their children seems to be as uh, their own emotional self-expression. Um, at least that's what they say, I'm sure it's not true. You know, because usually you spend a lot of time making peanut butter sandwiches, in my experience anyway. Um, uh, uh, and it's not very emotionally fulfilling. But uh, we think that children should be important for our emotional fulfillment. Um, and this is what people argue about in courts and why uh, modern day divorces are so important. Uh, so there are many, many different things happening within the, the, the realm of character formation, and family life and personal life. Uh, which I suspect are being impacted upon by the world out there, but it might just as well be the case that the interactions going the other way and the changes that are happening in the indiv individual world are impacting upon uh, political, social life. Mm -hmm. I just argued with your interpretation of Marx. That won't actually, I'll do it afterwards. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm regretting this. Uh, the, anatomy of, uh, the anatomy of man is a key to the anatomy of the ape, says Marx. It's not by s understanding the past that we understand present. It's by understanding the present, the present in its more developed forms reveals the less developed form. That's what I meant. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll show, we'll go back out to the audience. Any points, questions? Yeah, I'd like to say something to this. Um, the gentleman at the back mentioned um, his memory of childhood being very free and most of us of a certain age will agree with that. Uh, you know, the idea you went out in the morning to play and you, you were called back for tea at tea time, five o'clock. So you'd be out all day doing whatever you did on your bicycle, playing cowboys, blah. So no adults around to be telling you what to do, asking you what you're doing from the mobile point of view, uh, supervising your trip to school and back. Um, the freedom was terrific and, and I'm one wondering and have been concerned what effect it must have on children as they're growing up to have had a back, have had a, an upbringing of constant adult interference and supervision. And I, I do find it quite worrying. I'm not sure what the implications are. You gentlemen must or maybe have seen the result of this kind of thing already coming through. Um, yeah, uh, I don't. I don't know anything about that. All I know is my own experience. My concern that children will never have the freedom we had, and it was wonderful. And I think it gives you a certain. Maybe this is pushing it a bit. Independence of thought and action, and um, appreciation of freedom. You know that they have never experienced. I so find that really sad. Today's children have less unsupervised play than previous generations. Yes. Anyone else? Okay. I'm just wondering. No, you, yeah, you. Yeah. I'm just wondering um, what effect, um, what influence your own work on psychoanalysis might have had on your own approach to parenthood. Mm -hmm. okay. Good question. And was someone here? Dennis? Yeah, just a quick point. One of the um, things that we that seems to be sort of um, moving about all the time in every aspect is survival. You know, I survived an abusive relationship. I survived this and I survived that. 
one of the popular things is that you have a survived childhood or you survived childhood, you're told you survived childhood as if childhood is a minefield. And what we created out of this survival thing is the idea that we can apply it to all aspects of life. And what we created out of it is the sort of, if you like, uh, omnipresent, uh, ubiquitous idea that we are all victims of something. We can put into life some traumatic, ex some traumatic experience. Not that we found trauma in it, but that we're told it was traumatic. I can recommend a good book on the rise of the survivor <laughs> identity if anyone, want, if anyone wants to click on my profile. <laughs> Someone here? Hannah? Certainly, if we take the 60s onwards, the, this introduction of leisure time we have, I think certainly in the Western world, we have a lot more time on our hands. If I look back to my mother, who was bringing up four children, you know, with a mangle and um, fires that had to be lit, there was no central heating and no car, we didn't have a car, so you have to walk everywhere. So the actual amount of time she had to give her leisure attention either physically or mentally to her children and my father as well was a lot less and I, I think that in itself that even though I know some people are saying they're working two jobs or whatever I think on the whole people have time on their hands and what they're doing with the time on their hands how much are they being influenced with what the media is telling us to think about about their children or whatever or wanting to live through their children because they've got all this time on their hands and therefore they'll spend more time thinking and worrying about what should be doing with their children. So, curious to ask about that. Four points that to be honest, seem fairly valid to me. Any comments on that? Yes, all very good points. Uh, very interesting. Um, but um, when you're talking about childhood as being something that used to be free, um, I'm a little bit I'm a little bit sceptical about that, actually. Um, I didn't think that I'd be sitting here tonight talking about my childhood, but um, my memory of my childhood um, was not that it was wonderful and free. Um, yes, there was some freedom to it. Yes, I was able to walk to school four miles. No, I'm exaggerating. I was able to walk to school and back, and, and then later to, to go to school, which was over four miles away secondary school on my own. Um, <coughs> that will be difficult today, becoming more and more difficult, but um, that childhood was, was also a time when I was at the mercy of bullies and the, uh, the chaos in the playground and all of the petty rivalries and uh, nightmarish aspects of school. I, I think it's, it's very easy to look back on this childhood as something that has been lost and it's part of a romanticizing of another space away from this world that we live in now that I think is, is very seductive and, and very 
very tempting to, to fall into. And I suppose it connects with the question that Tony raised about um, adultifying our experience and reframing our experience in such a way that we, can, we find it difficult to grasp what it was actually like, but we reconfigure it uh, according to the, to the way that we understand uh, what it is to be an adult uh, today. Although I have to say, personally, I find it very difficult to understand what it means to be an adult today. Most of the time, I do feel uh, very childish. Oh, sorry, that fits with the theme which was <laughs> set up for tonight, so I shouldn't say that either. I want to, I, I want to return to, very, very briefly, uh, to the question of Jung, which was floated earlier. Um, and I said that Jung wasn't psychoanalytic, and there are a number of reasons why Jung is not psychoanalytic. First of all, Jung believes in a, a potential uh, free self, a self that becomes what he calls individuated um, and emerges through the process of uh, analysis, which psychoanalysis doesn't believe in. We don't believe that there is a true, real self that emerges. Uh, that has been hidden in the background and that has to be released. Um, Jung has an idea of cultural archetypes. Um, the Jungian analyst becomes an expert in Greek mythology and anthropology and is then able to interpret what the real meaning, the underlying meaning is of these dreams that you bring to analysis. Psychoanalysis doesn't buy that. The meaning of a dream is the meaning of the dream for the patient in analysis, not for the analyst. The analyst doesn't understand what they mean means, but gives space for the patient to be able to explore the meanings for themselves. And Jung believes that you can heal the division between the unconscious and consciousness, bring the two together. Psychoanalysis says that we are always split, always divided as subjects, divided in our unconscious and divided between consciousness and the unconscious. And finally, Jung does play this line that we reconfigure the past, that we reconfigure our past from the standpoint of the present so that we can completely remake ourselves. Now, psychoanalysis, for all of its talk about Naturgrifkeit and deferred action and the ways in which we rework the past within the frame of the present, always takes seriously those primary traumatic, incomprehensible moments either in fantasy or in what was actually done to us as things which we have to deal with as adults. It doesn't try and pretend they can be wiped away. In that sense, psychoanalysis is a genuinely historical account of the human subject, not a relativist, postmodern dissolving of the narratives into the stories that we can tell ourselves at the moment, but a genuine historical account. In that sense, the discourse of psychoanalysis is compatible with the discourse of Marxism. James, uh, the first uh, childhood, one of the, our memories, nostalgia is not what it used to be. No, no I, 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 I'm sure with Ian of you. I mean, it's compelling, the nostalgic. Um, I, I, this isn't a put down because I, I've heard a very, very similar story. My aunt will tell exactly the same story of her childhood as I've heard twice tonight about, uh, you talked about it, and uh, a guy at the back talked about it, and it came to me very strongly, and she grew up in the countryside, so that's a slightly different world anyway, and she said they were locked out until it was dark. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, they were, if they came back, they were told off, um, and, and loved it, she says, she says, um, and, it's a uh, and somebody said, you know, and, uh, there weren't any adults there, which can't be true. <laughs> there must have been adults there. And I, I think, I, I look at my own children, I see that in their lives, uh, in a long, there's great passages of it where we're not there. I mean, to say that they're, they're thrilled and, and moved and angry about their relationships with their peers, which are all consuming, whereas we are kind of buzz, a boring buzz in the background, which is somewhat irritating. And, and we don't understand that. You know, we put meals on the table and tell them when bedtime is. To them it's all kind of noise. Um, so it would be interesting to know just how much of the memory is, is, is real. Uh, or not that it's not real, it, just that whether your parents would give the same account, I suppose. Um, um, yeah. Uh, uh, 
I, th I take very seriously this. Um, I, I do think there are, are, are um, things happening in, in uh, contemporary culture which are militate against uh, happiness, um, and uh, uh, part of them is, uh, you know, and, and I th I, it's it's uncomfortable to see people over wedded to uh, their children. Uh, and that's a weird thing to say in a way because, um, uh, you know, my parents were indifferent, you know, wildly indifferent, very, you know, exciting lives they lived and um, uh, did mad things and uh, left us alone in the house um, uh, because they had other things to do, you know, I mean, it's interesting the question of time. Uh, and sociologists do go back and forth on this. It's, uh, it's very hard to work out whether we have more or less time because Jonathan Gashuni did this where he said, um, you know, actually we, we work less hours. Each worker works less hours. He said, but look at the calls upon your time. Look at all the devices that are soaking your time up. You see that the parents with the kids like this, they're obviously not really in the same space. All of these, you know, I, I, I don't want to put it, pose it in a pessimistic, uh, optimistic, you know, op, uh, lost world, um, successful world. These are problems we have to deal with now. Um, I, I, and some of them are technical, you know, no screen day in our house, um, uh, not easy to enforce, but very, uh, works. Um, uh, I sound like a Tory now. Um, uh, uh, you know, they, they're practical problems to deal with. Some of them, I think, are socio-political or, or some cultural things that are trends which are, are problematic. And, and you see it, for example, in the way that um, uh, parents are incapable of being told by teachers that their children have behaved badly and argue with them and fight. I said this to my American students, I have these American students, that um, the National Union of Teachers had cause to complain about the number of assaults. Uh, and they said assaults by children. And they said, no, her salsa, but I was reading the NUT press release, but of parents, of both teachers, my American students that are hokey by comparison to us sophisticated English people, were <laughs> transfixed with horror, the very idea that somebody would lift a hand to a teacher. But that's it, and it does happen. I don't say it's, it happens a lot. Um, the National Union of Teachers are bound to make an issue out of it. They're teachers, after all. Uh, but it is a shocking thing that happens when the parent comes to the school with the attitude that uh, the insult to my child is an insult to me, uh, I will defend my child against all, and finds it difficult to recognize the authority, this is the word, authority of the school uh, within that relationship. Um, it's not always good, the authority of the school. Uh, however, the inability to recognize it, that's a sign of a, of a confusion, of a, uh, of a somewhat childish, Am I allowed to say that? A somewhat childish reaction on the part of the parents. Uh, an overemphasis of the uh, um, uh, adult-like character of their children that they would imagine that must come like lawyers to defend their rights. <coughs> and and a, a general confusion around the area of, um, uh, of the things that the adult world has that are worthwhile in transmitting. And that's it's really because our adult world isn't very confident on that score. You know, maybe it shouldn't be, but it doesn't really, it doesn't believe itself has got some good uh, um, account or valuable uh, things to transmit. And um, for that reason, it has, has a very confused attitude. Okay, we've not got much time, so we'll come out for the last um, few points. We can make them quite brief, and then we'll come back for the, the speaker's final comments. So uh, here. I think when I'm referring back to childhood, I wasn't, it was not time to, 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 to turn out to nostalgia. So when I talk about childhood, I talk about it, in, 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 which includes the bullying, the chaos, the, 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 the violence that, 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 that we experienced then. But, but what I remember is the vivacity of living as, as a child. Um, and, and I suspect, having heard the, what's been said tonight, is, is that, that, that somehow the, um, the, the, the crisis in, 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 in contemporary society, in, in modern society, perhaps, means that it's a kind of reflux back against childhood in a way to sort of iron that, that vastly out, you know, in, in a way. It's a sort of deadening of things. That's, that's what I'm, yeah, that's what I'm about. 
uh, recognising that I don't know the difference between psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. Um, Oliver James argues that childhood emotional damage is so endemic that the state should fund 15 hours of psychotherapy for all children uh, before they leave school. So my question is, is that a good idea uh, or not? That is a brilliant final question, <coughs> actually. Uh, Oliver James, public nuisance or force for good? <laughs> You want a yes or no answer? Do you? <laughs> yes, a yes or no answer, no subtleties. Yeah, yes or no. <laughs> no. The answer uh, so is yes. If you want no. to respond to any of these and then final comments. Well, you know, I think Oliver James is very mixed. Uh, he, he does he does give a, quite a useful analysis of what he calls affluenza. Uh, the idea that people should be searching after commodities and it's through getting more and more goods that they will become happy. Throwing that idea into question isn't a bad thing. It uh, rehearses again some of the critiques of capitalism that, that we urgently need. But the idea that uh, we should have, was it 15 hours a week of, uh, of, of care by experts funded by the state, it seems to be an absolute nightmare rather rather ridiculous, uh, rather ridiculous. Um, the vivacity of living, uh, I think, is, is a very nice phrase. And I think it does capture something not, not only of nostalgia and of romanticizing of childhood, but something of, of um, what happens to us and the sense of alienation that we feel in this society where everything is so heavily, thoroughly commodified, where we're turned into objects ourselves to be bought and sold and have to sell our labor power. We turn ourselves into a commodity as well, in, as, well as wanting more and more uh, commodities. Uh, something there that um, psychoanalysis can only tackle one by one in the clinic and you need uh, another kind of collective political practice uh, to tackle that uh, uh, in society. Marxism. <laughs> We've mentioned it before, but there is it is again. Um, the, uh, the, the, the question of um, undermining responsibility came up earlier, and it's, it's an important issue, and it's a debate inside psychoanalysis as well. Um, uh, there are tendencies inside psychoanalysis which, uh, which argue, very powerful tendencies, including in Lacanian psychoanalysis, I have to say, which argue that the aim of psychoanalysis is to enable people to become responsible for their actions. But most of us, as analysts, understand that responsibility in the sense of giving response and giving account of our actions to others, not of an isolated individual neoliberal, we might say, uh, hyper-individualism, but of something in which we recognize our relations to others and have to account for what we have done to others, because that's what it is to be a human being. That's what makes the practice of psychoanalysis possible, after all that we account to someone else for who we are and hear ourselves give account. And in that way, we become responsible. Thank you. James? I did meet Oliver James, who struck me as a little bit crabby, but um, <laughs> I, I, don't, <laughs> like Ian, I don't want to commit myself too <clears throat> hard. Um, I, I wonder about, you know, why would we, you spend, why would you finance the 15 hours? Uh, don't we have schools? <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's such a kind of surfeit of, of analysts and, and therapists that we could replace the teachers. My daughter, who's only 10, can I say, complains bitterly about um, circle time. She says to me, if that teacher asks me again how I'm feeling, I'm going to scream, she says. <laughs> um, and they, she thinks, I, I can't say she speaks for a class, but she thinks it's creepy. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, but it's, it's obviously innocent, you know, the, the teachers are, um, uh, are interested in therapeutic models and they might be right, they might be wrong, 
But all I know is that my daughter has an ear that can hear the weirdness of it. Um, uh, my friend on the uh, camera that asked a good question about, you know, why, why insist on, on, um, on the unconscious, on, on this apparently rather grandiose theoretical framework? And um, I don't know if you need to insist on every part of what Freud had to say, but there is something very um, important, it strikes me, is that um, uh, we are not conscious, rational beings. You know, uh, we are not only conscious, rational beings. You know, we are not um, like the, the Laputans hovering above the world in an absolutely rational way with all the answers that can, you know, with, with, through mathematics can resolve the world's problems. We are, you know, uh, our souls, uh, by whatever magic have been stapled onto animals, um, and um, uh, there's this, there is this interaction, and, and it, it strikes me as an important thing, and very hard to understand what freedom would mean if we weren't, um, if our conscious choices, the end result, we hope, uh, uh, didn't spring from places that were less than deliberate or conscious. What would the process be if the light just came on and we knew what the answer was? Wouldn't life would be absurdly easy, if not to say frighteningly, uh, without um, uh, there's, there is there must be a mediation uh, between um, uh, that world that isn't under our control, that um, uh, that isn't susceptible immediately to rational organisation, and um, I think this is valuable. This is valuable in Freud, and it, and it uh, must be insisted upon um, uh, because it is it is the defining step away to uh, to allow us to to look at the psyche, and I, I think it's great. And also, I'm I'm, I'm happy about it as a as a, a moral Freudian, uh, or you know, Freud supporter. I'm also happy as, about it as a as a as a moral philosopher because I think it it's. It's key um, to understanding what it is to um, to to make decisions, to uh, enact um, uh, choices. That um, um, that that reason is not um, the king and lord of us all, uh, uh, and uh, it, it it develops and grows. You know that it's it's um, that we make mistakes, that we, uh, and we have to be allowed to make mistakes. That freedom won't happen uh, if people can't make the wrong choice. If, if people are not allowed to make the wrong choices, how could they ever make the right choices? Uh, and this, you know, it's not surprising to me that um, um, childhood, adulthood is a, is a an axis on which where uh, we feel a bit confused because it all resolves around that thing that um, and th this is what childhood is is the um, uh, that maturation that makes it possible to make the step um, from bad choices which don't have too much terrible consequence um, uh, from uh, motives that you don't entirely understand uh, to something like um, uh, a degree of responsibility uh, for your life which of course never annihilates you know the the unbidden and and the um, the eccentric, as we know. You know, in the supermarket, your hand hovers over the insane item that you do not need, or uh, perhaps the click, or in the relationship that you can't resist messing up. Um, you know, we know that there are many ways that um, yeah we do stupid things. Uh, uh, but knowing that, I think, is what makes it possible to think of the possibility that uh, that there can be a transition. That you know, where there was an it, there might be an I. Mm. And one more thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is, is that I was puzzled when this was set up, and, and I knew that you were going to be here, James, um, having read your book, uh, The Death of the Subject Explained. I was puzzled about what the conflict would be, um, and where, in what way we would be set in opposition to each other and it turns out that we haven't at all you know we're saying the same kind of things about a problem which we've got, all got to we've all got to grapple with um, just something that you mentioned in your introduction uh, you mentioned R.D. Lang um, and his critique of mainstream forms of treatment I think one of the things that interesting about R.D. Lang is that R.D. Lang um, was uh, developing a critique of the medical model of medical psychiatry R.D. Lang was trained as a psychoanalyst. 
and it was his training as a psychoanalyst that alerted him to the fact that human beings are more than chemical processes and there's a process of puzzling about who we are, an existential aspect to the question that we need to grapple and that's why R.D. Lang became such an important influence in the development of the anti-psychiatry and democratic psychiatry movement in Britain which has expression today in the magazine Asylum. Asylum Magazine, Democratic for Psychiatry. I have copies of the latest issue here. You're welcome to come and buy one, and please take a leaflet and take out a subscription. Thanks very much. <laughs> I, had, I had made a note to mention that, to give you a plug. Um, yeah. Could give a thank you to a thank you for speaker.